Unfortunately, the audio for the sermon, as I preached it earlier today, it was very distorted. And so I'm unable to share the audio of what was recorded at church today and the video as well. I'm unable to share all of that with you, but that's not going to stop me. I am going to re-preach that sermon now so that all of you will be able to listen to uh, the message. You can also find the full commentary, the text of my sermon today. You can always find that at newfoundfaith.org. And so the scripture that we read from today in the responsive reading came from the third chapter of the book of Revelation. And I would ask all of you now to open up your Bibles over to the third chapter of the book of Revelation. And in the third chapter of the book of Revelation, there is a message. There are three messages that are directed to the three churches that are spoken to there in the third chapter of the book of Revelation. The message, there was a message that was sent to the church in Sardis. There was a message that was sent to the church in Philadelphia. And there was also a message that was sent to that familiar church that you have heard me uh, reference in the past and preach from or about in the past as well. That is the church of the Laodiceans. Now, for my message today, I focused in on the message that was directed to the church in Philadelphia. And if you are looking at the third chapter of the book of Revelation, you can go down to the seventh verse. That's where that message begins. My key verse for today will be the eighth verse. The eighth verse will serve as my key verse there in the third chapter of the book of Revelation. And I hope that all of you are looking at that. You'll see there in that verse that the scripture reads, I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door. Highlight that. And no one can shut it. No one can shut the open door for you have a little strength. You have kept my word and have not denied my name. Again, there in that eighth verse, the message to the church in Philadelphia was that I know your works. I have set before you an open door. Now, from that verse, I'm going to focus on today for a thought, an open door before you. I repeat again to you, an open door before you. Now, to me, if I were looking at this scripture for the very first time, I would come away with questions. Firstly, I would want to know, well, what is this door? What was the door that was set before those who were in the church in Philadelphia? I would want to know, well, what does that door, what does it open up to? I would be curious. What's behind that door? And if the door is open, what does it open up to? Lastly, I would wonder to myself, I would wonder whether or not that door that was set before the church in Philadelphia and was open to those who were of that church, I wonder whether or not it was exclusive to them. I would wonder whether or not it is possible for that door to be set before me. And I would wonder if it is possible for that door to be open for me and for, for anyone else. Now, if we pay close attention to that passage of scripture there in the third chapter of Revelation, we will find the answers to, to my questions and to questions that maybe you even have. Now, we'll see there in the seventh verse that the one that this message was coming from, the one that had this message directed to the church in Philadelphia is he who is holy. He who is true and also he who has the key of David. Now, let us understand that the one who is holy, the one who is true and the one that has the key of David, that can be none other than Christ himself. Now, to confirm that statement, let us go over what it is that we know about Christ. We know that 
that Christ, he is the only begotten son of God, right? We know that as the only begotten son of God, we know that Christ, that he is holy, that he is righteous. We know that he's divine. We know that he is incorruptible, right? In other words, we, we know that he is perfect. He doesn't have any flaws. He doesn't have any blemishes. And, and we also know that as Christ, we know that he's God in the flesh. Let us remember what Jesus said about himself to the disciples as it is recorded in the 14th chapter of John's gospel in the sixth verse. To the disciples, we remember that Jesus, he said, I am the way. He said, I am the truth. And then he said to the disciples, I am the life. Jesus, we should also remember. We should also remember that Jesus, he came through the seed of David. He came through, in other words, the lineage of David, which gave to him the right to inherit the throne as king of Israel. Now, today, Jesus, he is not only the king of Israel. He is now sitting at the right hand of God. And what is it that he's doing sitting at the right hand of God? Well, Jesus, he is watching over all things as he sits at the right hand of God. Jesus, he is the sovereign ruler. Now, we'll see there again, as we take a look there at that seven verse. We'll see that Jesus, he is the one that has authority over the door that had been set before the church in Philadelphia and that had been open to those who are in that church in Philadelphia. Jesus, he stated there in that seven verse that only he can open, only he can shut that door. Nobody else is able to open. Nobody else is able to shut that door. So for the questions that we had about that door, we know who it is that, that we can turn to for answers. I don't have to turn to anybody else about this open door. You don't have to turn to anybody else about this open door. You can go to Christ. Because again, Christ, he has authority over that door. So we can ask him, why did he sit the door before the church in Philadelphia? And we can ask him, is that door only exclusive to those who are in the church in Philadelphia? Now, here in my key verse, there in that eighth verse, Jesus, he tells us, he gives us the reason as to why that door was set before those who are in the church in Philadelphia and why that door was open to those who were in that church. Jesus, he tells us that the reason he set an open door before the church in Philadelphia was because of their works. And I want you to understand that their works speaks to their activities of faith in the Lord. Not works done out of religion. So what were their works? Jesus, he tells us there in that a verse, he tells us that they kept his word. Now, let us know that to keep, that means to retain. So they retain the word to keep means to preserve. It means to to maintain to keep also means to to stay or to continue in. So in other words, those who are in that church, they stayed in the word and they continued in the word of Christ to keep also can mean to be faithful to. So they were faithful to the word. I want you to understand today that the church in Philadelphia was a faithful church. And even more to, to this point about this church being a faithful church, in Jesus, he said of their works that they had not denied his name. Now that statement is, is truly significant. It is of great significance when we think about that time period. You see, during that time period, it was coming and it was even expected 
for one to deny Christ. If you think about this for a moment, right? When, when Peter was trying to follow after Jesus, when Jesus had been arrested, did, did he not deny knowing Christ? Peter, he denied knowing Christ up to three times. So during, during the time period here that we're looking at there from the third, in the third chapter of the book of Revelation, it was coming and it was even expected for those who would profess to believe in Christ to deny it. And they would do that to preserve their lives. However, with this church, the church in Philadelphia, this church, it was a faithful church as it remained true. It remained steadfast to the name of Christ. It did not deny him. Those who were in this church, they had absolutely no shame in proclaiming the name of Christ. So to be clear here, because of their faith, because they moved in sincere faith. That was their works. In Jesus, he said that he set an open door before that church. Now, the question still remains, is the open door of Christ, is it exclusive only to those who were of the church in Philadelphia? What do you think? Now, to get a solid answer for this question, let us turn over to the seventh chapter of Matthew's gospel. And there in the seventh chapter of Matthew's gospel, I want you to take a look at the seventh and the eighth verse. We'll see there in the eighth verse that Jesus, he stated, for everyone who asks receives and he who seeks, they find, Jesus said, and to him who knocks, it will be opened. Jesus said, so not according to my word, but according to the word of Christ, everyone potentially has access to that door, but that door, I want you to understand today that door, it is only open to those who knock on its door. And so I ask all of you today, do you want God to open up doors for you? So if the Lord will only open doors to those that will actually knock on that door, that raises another question. The question that, that is raised now is, well, how do we go up and how do we knock on God's door? You see, we may, we may want that door to be opened up to us. But Jesus said that we have to knock on the door. So how do we go up and knock on the door of God? It's not like we can go up and, and physically knock on that door, right? So how do we knock on the door of God? Jesus, he once again has an answer for us there in that seventh and that eighth verse. In the seventh and the eighth verse of the seventh chapter of Matthew's gospel, Christ, he, he gives to us three means that we can take in order to seek God's blessings, in order to seek God's answers, in order to seek his help and solutions to our problems, what it is that we may be going through in life. Those three means, Jesus, he says there in the seventh and in the eighth verse, those three means are asking, seeking, and knocking. Now, does this mean that, that God is withholding blessings, that he's hiding blessings, that he's hiding answers, that he's withholding answers, that he's withholding solutions from us? Is that what that means? No, absolutely not. You see, I want you to understand the answers, the solutions, the blessings, they are already here. They are already available to us. But what Jesus expresses there in that seventh and in that eighth verse is that some diligence 
and some effort is required on our part at times while we are on this journey in order for us to receive what we desire. You see, a lot of us, we, we want things to instantly pop up like that in our life. But Jesus says that there's some effort on our part, some diligence that's required on our part in order for us to, to receive what it is that we desire. You see, out of those three means there, asking, asking is the easiest of those three means. And, and most of the time when you ask, you will receive. Asking most of the time, therefore, it'll suffice. It will do. However, as we have learned through our very own journeys, there are times where we have to do a bit more than ask, don't we? There are times where we have to seek. And I want you to understand here, to seek, that requires us to actually put forth an effort. That actually requires us to move in our faith. You see, a lot of people, they, they think that asking is all that they have to do. But I think of the promised land for the children of Israel to where they had to journey to the promised land. And then when they reached the point to cross over to the, uh, the promised land, they had to literally cross over the Jordan into the promised land. And then they had to take possession of the blessing. So as we have learned through our very own journeys, there are times where we have to do a bit more than ask. We have to seek. And again, to seek, that requires us to actually put forth an effort of moving in our faith towards our blessings, moving in our faith towards our answers, moving in our faith towards our solutions. Now, something that we have also learned on our own journeys in life is that there are often times where obstacles will block our path, right? There are times where we know that we could be moving towards our blessings. And the next thing you know, we are met with a, a door that is closed, a door that is shut. So there in that seventh and in that eighth verse, knocking on the door, I want you to understand that that is indicative of a pathway appearing to be closed off from us. That is indicative of a pathway appearing to be shut off from us, blocking us from being able to receive that blessing or being able to receive answers and, and solutions to questions or problems that we may have. And so on this journey, I want you to understand that there will certainly be times where you have to knock on the door of God. There are times where you have to knock on that door in order for you to be able to obtain your blessing, in order for you to be able to attain your answers and your solutions. But sadly, many of us, we never go beyond the point of asking because that's the easiest thing for us to do is to ask. Even sadder than that is the fact that many people, they don't even bother with the asking. They don't do anything. But again, they expect for that blessing to pop up just like that. You see, sadly, so many of us, we are, we are quick to give up in life. Do you understand that, that many of us, we are quick to, to give up on our dreams, our aspirations. Many of us, we are quick to give up on success. We are quick to give up on, on truly prospering because we get so discouraged when we feel like the Lord isn't answering us. For one to be so quick to give up, I tell you today that that would suggest that they are fine with not having received a blessing. It would suggest that they are comfortable with not finding answers to questions that they may have or 
not finding solutions to a problem, to their trials, their tribulations, what it is that may be afflicted them. They may, if they are so quick to give up, be comfortable in their trials and, and their tribulations. Maybe the one that that is so quick to give up, maybe they have not reached that level of need, that need of, of getting out of whatever it is that they're going through or that need of the blessing. Maybe they don't need it badly enough. I tell you today that, that many of us, we are, we are settling for less in life because we don't want to put forth the effort of faith. You see, we should, as sincere believers, we should never settle for less when we know that God's desires toward us is of peace, a future, and a hope. You should know today that the Lord desires for you to be blessed. You should know today that the Lord, he desires for you to prosper in your life. I say to you today that, again, if you truly desire to be blessed, if you truly desire to succeed, if you, if you truly desire to find answers and solutions, if you truly desire to prosper, I want you to know today that there will be times that you need to seek. There are times where you need to be willing to seek the Lord in prayer. There are times where you need to be willing to seek the Lord in the word. And then beyond seeking, I want you to understand that there is knocking on the door of God. There is knocking on the door of Christ. And when you knock on his door, that shows your commitment to pressing forward in faith, regardless of what it is that you are going through. Regardless of what it is that we may be going through in life, when we knock on a door, it shows our commitment. I think about, I think about the people that will come up to your door and they want to talk to you for a minute, whatever it is that they're trying to sell to you. They want to talk to you. And, you know, some will come up, they'll ring the doorbell. And, and after they ring the doorbell, if no one opens up the door, they'll turn and they'll go away. But then there are others, they will ring the doorbell. And if no one has come to the door, they'll actually knock on the door. And, you know, when, when someone when they knock on the door, it shows that they are serious about getting your attention, aren't they? They are serious about what it is, what it is that they desire. When, when there's something, an obstacle that is hindering, that is blocking you on your pathway towards your blessing or towards your answer or, or towards your solutions, when, when you knock on the door, it shows that you are serious about what it is that you desire that blessing, that answer, those solutions. It shows that you are serious. It shows that you are committed. You and I, I want you to understand today, you and I, we must keep knocking on the door when that door is shut, when it is closed to us. We must keep knocking on the door. We must keep pressing forward until the pathway opens up before us. You see, the door, it was opened before the church in Philadelphia because they kept pressing forward where the other churches in that day, they were denying the name of Christ. They weren't pressing forward. The only of the seven churches, the only other church that was encouraged to keep pressing forward was the church in Smyrna. But the other five churches, and I, and I, I won't include the church of Ephesus in this in this one, but the four other churches there, they, they struggled with being steadfast in faith. Are you struggling today when it comes to, to your faith? You see, I want you to understand today that when the Lord, when he sets an open door before you, 
the Lord, he doesn't open that door after you have gone through all of that work, that effort of, of seeking for the door, knocking on the door. God doesn't open that door up for you to just stare at him. Do you understand what I mean by that? You see, when God, when he sets an open door before you, the Lord, he expects for you to pass through that door. He expects for you to go through that doorway. In other words, when God sets an open door before you, he expects for you to enter that door. Now, this is shown to us. It is expressed to us. Recorded in the. 10th chapter of John's gospel and the ninth verse. We're in the 10th chapter of John's gospel and the ninth verse. Jesus, he said there, I am the door that again, that speaks to his authority. This is how he has authority over that door. He is the door. But we'll see there in that ninth verse that Jesus said, if anyone enters by me, he will Jesus said, be saved. If anyone enters, do you see what that implies there? If anyone enters, you see, when I look at that, that if there, it implies that some, some may choose not to enter even after they have sought for the door, even after they have knocked on the door, even after Christ has opened that door for them. Some. They may just look and not enter in. I say to you today, let us not be one that was so committed to knock on the door only to back out when the door has been opened, only for us to just sit there and, and look with wide eyes when that door has opened. No, when that door opens, it's time for us to move in faith. It's time for us to enter in. Now, some of you, you, you may begin to wonder, well, pastor, what's on the other side of the door? What is it that I'm walking into? Again, we'll see that Jesus has answers for us there. As we take a look at that ninth verse there in John's gospel, the 10th chapter. Jesus, he said there in that ninth verse, he said that those who go through that door that he sets before them and that he opens, Jesus said that they will go out and they will find pasture. So to be clear here on the other side of the door that only Christ can open and close. Jesus says that there is pasture for you to go out into. Now, some of us will say, oh, that's it. Just the field. What about the riches? That's what some of us, we, we may ask. Some of us, we may wonder, well, what's in the pasture? What is it that's in the pasture? Jesus, he once again has an answer for us. And again, I want you to understand today. These aren't my words. These are words that's coming from Christ. And we'll see Jesus there in the 10th verse. I'm still in the 10th chapter of John's gospel. And Jesus, he said, I have come that they, the they there, I want you to understand that's speaking to all of those who enter by him. Those who go through that door that has been opened. Those that, that were committed enough to knock on the door. Jesus said that I have come that they may have life. That they may have it, life more abundantly. So let's be again, very clear about this. The open door that Christ will set before you. If you are moving in sincere faith, if you knock on that door, Jesus said that that door that he opens, that it leads to life. And again, I remind you that Jesus, he said that he is the way that he is the truth. And that he is the life. And so this thought, it, it should, it should make us wonder whether or not we have life today. Now, now some of us, we would say, well, pastor, 
I'm living and I'm breathing. I I must be alive. That's what, what some of us, that's what some of us will say. Well, I say to you today that if you have not on the door of Christ, and if you have gone through that door, I say to you today that you have found life. And, and, and I believe that everyone, since everyone has access to this door, I believe that everyone, they should knock on this door and go through this door because everyone has access to life. And when I say life, I'm not talking about life in this world, as it was said in the Sunday school lesson for for this week. The life of uh, that, that the Lord has for us through his grace, he desires to show us the riches that exceeds that far exceeds the, the riches that are of this world. So being able to go through God's doors into the pasture of life, I want you to understand that that is of the greatest value. There is nothing in the world that compares to being able to go out into the pasture that the door of God leads to. You see, in our recent Sunday school lessons, Paul, he expressed this same thought. Where, where Paul, he said that he counted all things that he had gained in the world. He counted those things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of life in Christ. So if you enter the door that the Lord sets before you, I want you to understand today that you are finding something that is greater than the riches of this world. You are going to come to the knowledge of life, real life. In Christ. Now, again, I understand that this, it won't sound like much to, to many people. But I want to show you what a man who would know a thing or two about knowledge. I want to show you what, what he had to say over in the eighth chapter of Proverbs. We're over in the eighth chapter of Proverbs. We will see where Solomon he spoke of this excellence, this knowledge, this knowledge of life in Christ, as he urged for one to move to obtain God's excellency, which again, Solomon will say himself was far greater than any riches. And this was a man that had plenty, plenty of riches. Now, as we turn there to the eighth chapter of Proverbs, and as we look there at the first three verses, we'll see that Solomon, he asked, does not wisdom cry out and understanding lift up her voice? We see that he is personifying wisdom. Solomon, still personifying wisdom, said there, she, wisdom, takes her stand on the top of the high hill beside the way where the paths meet. She, wisdom, Solomon said, cries out by the gates at the entry of the city, at the entrance of the doors. And Solomon, I want you to understand very clearly here, was speaking about wisdom, but I again would like to point out how we today, how we should recognize that wisdom is Christ. We should see Christ in this statement here from Solomon. Even though Solomon did not know of Christ, Solomon, I want you to understand, he was speaking about Christ here. If we skip down to the 22nd and the 23rd verse there, we'll see that wisdom personified, that wisdom stated the Lord possessed, to possess means to have or to had. The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way before his works of old. Wisdom said, I have been established from everlasting from the beginning before there was ever an earth. Now, now I want you to think about this. Think about this for a moment. What was it that John wrote in the first chapter of, of his gospel? Did John, did he not say in the first verse, in the first chapter of, of the gospel, according to John, did he not say in the beginning was the word and that the word was with God and that the word was God? 
I don't know if you see what I'm what I'm saying there, but wisdom said that it was there with God in the beginning. But again, John said that the word was there in the beginning with God and that the word was God. And then in the 14th verse there in the first chapter of John's gospel, we remember this scripture because I say it all of the time that the word, it became a flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of who the only begotten of the father, the word. I want you to understand, as I have said several times before, the word is God. The word is Christ himself. And Christ, I want you to understand, was there in the beginning before there ever was an earth. Christ came from everlasting. He came from eternity, from being with his father. Jesus, I want you to understand that Jesus, that he is wisdom personified. He is wisdom, I want you to understand, in the flesh. He is the word of God in the flesh. The word of God, I want you to understand, is wisdom. Now, to connect Christ, to connect him to this proverb, even more, wisdom, wisdom said that it cried out from the top of hills by the gates at the entrance of the city. Guess what Jesus did? Jesus, he cried out from hills and, and from mountains to, to multitudes. He cried out for the people to, to repent from wickedness. Again, wisdom personified. At his crucifixion, let us remember that that Jesus, he was made to carry his cross to a place called Golgotha, a place called Calvary, which was a hill just outside the gates of Jerusalem. Wisdom said that it was outside the gates. Jesus is, again, wisdom personified. What I want you to understand today we have Jesus being the door, that wisdom is the door. That again, the life that is out in the pasture, that is found in the wisdom, in the knowledge of, of Christ. So I want you to understand today that life in the pasture is filled with being able to grow closer together with Christ, to know him more intimately, through your own personal fellowship with him. Now, again, too many knowing Christ at such a intimate level, being in fellowship with him more intimately, that may not seem like much. However, I want you to understand today that a man that knew a thing or two about wisdom, he saw great value in the pasture and in being able to obtain true riches. We'll see there in the 18th verse that, that Solomon, he said that those who obtain wisdom from God will both obtain riches and honor. Now again, I tell you today, I believe that, that Solomon, I believe that he knew a thing or two about wisdom. We know that, that Solomon that he received a wise and an understanding heart from the Lord so that he could be able to discern between good and evil so that he could be able to understand justice. Now, again, to be clear here, Solomon said that with wisdom, one is able to obtain both riches and honor, but the honor and the riches that, that Solomon spoke of there are enduring. He said that they are enduring riches, that they are enduring to righteousness. Enduring means that they are lasting. They don't perish away. They aren't here today, gone tomorrow. They endure. They last. Solomon said that that wisdom's fruit, therefore the fruit of Christ, because Christ is wisdom. Solomon said that it is better than gold fine gold. And again, this was someone that knew a thing or two about gold. Solomon said that again, wisdom's fruit, that is the fruit of Christ. He said that its revenue is better than choice silver. And again, this was someone that knew a thing or two about choice silver. 
of wisdom, Solomon said that wisdom, that again is Christ, traverses. It travels the way of righteousness and in the midst of the paths of justice so that those who love wisdom will inherit wealth. Do you desire to inherit wealth today? Again, he said that they will inherit wealth and fill their treasuries with that wealth. So many of us in our dreams and in our aspirations, we desire to find great success. We desire to find great happiness. And I want you to understand today that there is absolutely nothing wrong with with those dreams and those aspirations of of success and, and happiness. Absolutely nothing wrong with desiring to prosper, to succeed in life. If you did not desire to succeed, if you did not desire to find happiness, if you if you did not desire to to prosper in life, I would even wonder what is wrong with you. However, where many of us go wrong is that rather than going through the doors that God will open, that will lead to great success, that will lead to one truly prospering, we turn and we go elsewhere. Again, I want you to understand today that there is great wealth in the pasture that God opens his doors up to. Now, again, I want to be very clear about this. The wealth that is inherited by those that go out into that pasture, that the doors of Christ will open up to, what they lead to is not made up of silver, it's not made up of gold, it's not made up of Washington's, it's not made up of Benjamin's, nor is it made up of stocks and bonds. The wealth that those who graze in that pasture, that wealth is that of of spiritual gifts given to them by the Lord our God. And again, I understand this. It won't sound like much to many people, but there in the 34th and the 35th verse there, Solomon said, blessed is the man who listens to me, wisdom, Christ. Watching daily at my gates, the gates again of wisdom, the gates again of Christ, waiting at the post of my doors, again, the doors of wisdom, the doors of Christ. For whoever finds me, the proverb says, finds life and obtains, I want you to hear this clearly, and obtains favor from the Lord. True success, I want you to understand, it is available to everyone. However, true success can only be enjoyed by those who actually go and knock on God's door and then enter in. And Solomon said that whoever goes into the pasture of God that that door opens up to, they obtain God's favor. And, And personally, myself, I much rather obtain the favor of God over anything else that I might be able to obtain in life and in this world. And again, I understand today that that such a thought, it will put off many. Again, I understand today that such a thought, it won't sound like much to many. But I want you to understand today that with God's favor, in my trials, in my tribulations, in my great affliction that that I went through in life, I was lifted up by the Lord. You see, when it initially seemed impossible for me to make it, I want you to understand that, that I was able to make it when Christ set forth that door before me and when he opened that door up to me and I entered in. That's how I made it. You see, going out into that pasture that is beyond the door that that he will open. It has given me new life, new understanding, new knowledge. 
as I have slowly learned over time not to be so stressed and and not to be so anxious because I know and I have learned that God, he will provide. He provides all of the time. With the life given to me from grazing in his field, in his pasture, I have slowly learned to be more at peace. And and again, I want you to understand today, while, while that peace, while it may not seem like much to many people, it means everything to me. Being at peace in my heart, I want you to understand that it is far more valuable to me than any amount of wealth that I could go out and grind and hustle for. At the start of the year, many of us, we we like to say, new year, new me. Yet I wonder how many of us are actually going to change where it counts. I wonder how many of us are going to change in our hearts this year. I, I wonder how many of us are going to keep passing by the door of God? How many of us, I wonder, aren't going to stop and knock on the door of God this year? New year, new you, right? Do something differently this year. If you haven't stopped and knocked at that door, do it. If you haven't gone through that door that has been opened before you by the Lord, do it. You see, I I urge all of you today, here at the beginning of this new year to recognize the door that has been set before you that only Christ can open. Only Christ can open and shut that door. Behind those doors, as we have seen here today, I want you to understand that you will prosper. You will find true success. You will find that true success through wisdom, and through knowing the Lord. So I encourage you today, don't pass by that door. Stop passing by that door for some other doors that you may see open to you. You see, behind those doors awaits nothing but mediocrity and failure. And I again say to you today that nobody, absolutely nobody, should desire that mediocrity and failure. Thanks for watching this week's sermon. I hope that you enjoyed this sermon and that you'll be able to apply what you have watched, that you have heard, that you have listened to, apply it to yourself and then share it with somebody somewhere. And if you haven't done so already, make sure that you're following the Newfound Faith channel. Be sure that you're following today so that you don't miss a sermon, so that you don't miss a Sunday school lesson, a Bible study or a food for thought. And if you haven't done so already, make sure that you share the Newfound Faith channel with someone somewhere.